Hi, I'm Chukudumobi. Welcome to Stand Yafo. Today, we are going to discuss the Sword of the Spirit. It is a lovely episode. I've been looking forward to it. So this episode is just a penultimate episode before the last one, which is the Helmet of Salvation. Don't miss the last one. The last we're going to look at the connection of the mind, the brain, as a weapon against the enemy. As a weapon that's going to help us stand and stand there for. But today's episode is also exciting, the sword of the spirit. You know, we've been taught that the sword of the spirit is an offensive weapon alone. But I'm going to show you in today's episode that the sword of the spirit is not just an offensive weapon alone. It is also a defensive weapon. Have you ever wondered why when you see soldiers fighting with the sword, they are not only trying to penetrate the flesh of their opponents, they are also using the sword to ward off the enemy's sword or spear or arrow attack. So the sword is a defensive weapon as it is an offensive weapon. Like um, I showed when I spoke about the shield of faith. You can see that the military man, the soldier that was fighting in that video clip I showed, was using his shield also as an offensive weapon. He used that shield to kill some of his enemies. And we've been taught that the shield is only a defensive weapon. No! The shield of faith is also an offensive weapon. With your faith, when you speak, you use your faith to back up those words, believing that everything you've said will come to pass. When you make a prophetic declaration, you use your faith in the offensive to bring those things to pass. When you command devils out of a situation, you use your faith as an offensive weapon to ensure that those devils go out. Now hear this, there is nothing you do with God outside faith that works. That is why the key, or if you might, the master key is faith. The master key is not prayers. The master key is faith. Because I've seen a lot of people pray in fear and their prayers. They never got the result of it. They prayed very anxiety. They prayed filled with worry. And that's those prayers never yielded results. Because what yields results? is faith. So today we're going to talk about the sword of the spirit, both as an offensive weapon as well as a defensive weapon. Join me on the other side. Welcome back. Our text is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And the Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord. Two things I want to point out there. Number one, this sword of the Spirit was clearly identified as the word of the Lord. And the second thing which we always overlook is the first two words of that verse which says, and take. This means you must take. If you don't take, the sword of the spirit will be ineffectual. You must activate it. You must use it. You must put it from passive to active. You must move from the letter of the word to the realm of the word. It is taking up that sword of the spirit that produces results, both as an offensive weapon as well as a defensive weapon. Now, swords. If you watch a swordsmith or a blacksmith forge a sword, you find out the first thing he does, he gets steel, melts it in the furnace, then pours it into the cast. When it is poured into the cast, he moves from liquid to solid, but still red hot. He gets his hammer and start beating it. And when you watch some of these mystical movies or series, I'm sure you must have come about some specialized swords. One of the movies or books or series that might come to mind 
is that sword that was stuck in a stone. It was a mystical sword and a lot of things surrounded that sword. Different stories that it was given by the gods, it was given by some spirits, it was forged in somewhere and something or some, some, somehow. But what I'm trying to point out is that they tried to associate the sword to something mystical or something spiritual. You also watch series like Game of Thrones, you hear them talk about steel, Valerian steel, the swords made from that steel are beautiful, perfect swords for, for warfare. This means that the content, the composition, the material with which that sword is made from or made of is important to the potency of that sword. And Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And before he made that statement, he said, the flesh will profit you nothing. But the words I speak unto you, they are first spirit. So if that sword or the good sword in Game of Thrones is made from Valerian steel and Excalibur has some mystical context or mystical origin to it, this sword of the spirit has been made clear to us from what it is just called, the sword of the spirit, meaning its source is the spirit. And Jesus confirmed it in that verse. So the word of the Lord, its composition, its content is the spirit of the Lord. <laughs> oh. So when you declare God's word, God's spirit moves into action. <laughs> when God saw the earth in its destructive state, the Bible says there was darkness, the earth was without form and it was void and darkness was everywhere. But the Bible says that the spirit was hovering over the darkness, over the deep. And the Lord said, what happened when the Lord spoke? As God spoke, the spirit moved into action. Until you speak, the spirit will not move into action. Until you speak, the spirit will not be activated. The spirit was in the midst of the chaos and yet nothing happened. I never wondered why. See, God is omnipresent, meaning God is everywhere. In the midst of your confusion, God is there. In the midst of that problem, God is there. With that mountain in front of you that have refused to move, God is there. And some of you foolishly will ask, where is God? He has abandoned me. Hey, God is in that present situation waiting for you to activate the Spirit. Do you know who the Spirit of God is? The Spirit of God is the power of God. The power company of God is the Holy Ghost. With all that power, your problem will continue persisting till you switch on the power so current will flow and destabilize and scatter those problems and destroy those mountains before you. The how the spirit will be moved into action, how the power of God will be moved into action is when you speak. So until you speak, nothing happens. You carry God's power on your inside. The God's power is present with you. Until you speak, nothing happens. Let this word sink in. Why that problem is still persisting is that you've kept quiet. You need to become a talk active in the realm of the spirit. You need to start speaking the word of the Lord over the situation. Instead of speaking those present facts. Yes, I know you are, you are in pain. Yes, I know you have that sickness. Yes, I know this and that is still persisting. Stop talking the problem. It is time to start talking the solution. And the solution are in the promises of God. Take up the word of the Lord and start declaring it. As you do that, you will call those things that be not as though they were. 
That is when the word of the Lord is in its offensive state. <laughs> oh, Maro Shata. He sent his word and he healed them. What was sent? The word. The word healed them. His spirit. <laughs> so, the content of that word is the Holy Ghost. When you have some um, bacteria and all those things causing trouble in your body, they prescribe some antibiotics. And some of those antibiotics are put in capsules. Now, when you take the capsules, get into your tummy, what happens is that the plastic coating disintegrates. So the methane that is inside will come out and permeate your blood vessels and target all those bacteria, all those pathogens causing sickness in your body and it kills them. So is the word of the Lord. When it is spoken, it is spoken in a, <laughs> like in a container of the word. When that word hits its target, it explodes and the spirit, the power of God, the energy of God dissipates that situation. That is how powerful the word is. That is, how, that is the harmony between the word of God and the spirit of God, which is the power of God. I want to talk to you about the word of the Lord. See, the Bible also talks about it as being a double-edged sword. And the Bible keeps talking about that this double-edged sword comes from the mouth. As I have said, let your words be like a sharp sword. In my, in my mouth. The psalmist also says something in Psalm 149. He said, see, let the high praise of God be in our mouth and a double-edged sword in our hand. The high praises of God in our mouth, a double-edged sword in our heart. And you might say, but that's, that is praise. It's not with the word of the Lord. Yeah, in the course of this episode, I'm going to show you one of the two ways you can decimate, you can release this word of God, this sort of the spirit. One way is by prophetically declaring it Another way is by prophetically singing it or prophetic worship. <laughs> oh my, my God. Yeah, I'm sure you're hearing some crazy, crazy things. Now, you've heard that the Son of the Spirit is a defensive weapon. Don't worry, I'm going to explain that. Now you're hearing that this Son of the Spirit can be released by singing. Oh yes, there is something called prophetic worship. This is one concept our worship leaders need to understand and learn. Where they will just sing, cripples will rise from their wheelchairs. Where they will just sing, devils in the hall and the congregation will disappear without anybody saying, come out. Where they will sing, sicknesses, diseases will take off. Because one man, one lady that understands that worship is not just singing, but it is prophetically declaring the word of the Lord to present circumstances. And those words, song, will bring about deliverance and change to people's lives. So join me, join me, join me, join me. Join me, join me. Oh God, I'm getting so excited. The power of God is upon me. But let me just calm down. Let me just calm down. I need to teach. <laughs> I need to teach. Oh. Vaya so for a hata. Now when you, when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 3. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not Canal, meaning they're not physical, they're not material things, they're not things you can see, they're not things of the flesh. But he said, See, but they are mighty, they are not canal, but they are mighty in God, mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. He now said, How is this done? He said, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That is New King James Version. King James Version says, casting down every vain imagination and every high thing that have exalted itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not only do you cast it down, but you bring it to the obedience of Christ. That is fantastic. So, these are our weapon. They are not flesh. That is why Words can be seen. I love it that God made it thus. That words cannot be seen. Because the word that you speak, those words are released by your spirit. It is not your flesh talking. If it were your flesh talking, then every dead person should be able to talk. 
That is why once a person dies and the spirit leaves, that flesh is dormant, is useless. <laughs> it's paralyzed, it's immobile, it cannot do anything. What makes your flesh, your body alive is your spirit. That is why the words I speak are from my spirit. That's why they are invincible. The same way my spirit is invincible. You can't see my spirit, you can't see my words. So my words are a product of my spirit. My words and my spirit are one. A man and his words are one. Here on earth, to hold a man accountable to some things, you get a man to sign contracts, sign papers. So the court will use his signature that he has appended on that contract against him and force him to keep to the terms of that contract. And guess what? In the realm of the spirit is different. Nobody has time to write anything for you to sign. In the realm of the spirit, how contracts are cut is with your words. Because those your words are a direct output of your human spirit. And your human spirit is a real you. That's why you go and that's why if you go to Satan to cut a deal with him, the intermediary, either a high priest or whoever that person is will get you to say some words. Those words that you say in front of that altar is signing you to an agreement. Another thing used to greet an agreement in the realm of the Spirit is your blood. Do you know why? The Bible says that in your blood is your life. See, the life of every animal is in the blood. So they can use your blood too to sign you up. They can use your words to sign you up. That is why when you cut a marriage covenant, you become married by the word spoken. You say those vows to each other. You agree to stand with each other either in good times or in bad times. You are signing an agreement. You are cutting a covenant. And there is an unseen party, the enforcer of that covenant, Either God or Satan, depending on whose altar you went to cut that marriage covenant with, is the one that oversees that covenant. And make sure that the two of you are held accountable in keeping that contract of love you signed with your mouth. So words are powerful. Words are powerful. The word of God. The Bible says that his words are sharper than a double-edged sword even to the dividing asunder of the spirit and the soul. Well, it is known that the spirit and the soul are fused together. But the word of the Lord is so sharp and so powerful that it can split two entities of the spirit and soul. About 10 years ago, I stumbled on something and I was curious about it. And he started teaching me. I won't give you the details, but what he taught me is that one day I was listening to a message and I found myself preaching that message, verbatim to somebody else, without my knowledge, until I listened to that message again, I was like, oh, and this preacher just said, <laughs> and this preacher just said what I just taught this person. Ah, what I just thought now, this preacher just, I mean, what, word, word for word, I was like, wow, the spirit is one. And the Holy Ghost on my inside said, yes, the spirit is one, but you know, in the sense you were saying it. I was like, what do you mean, Lord? He said, you actually listened to that message. I said, no, I've not listened to it. Yes, it is part of the message I'm, I was listening to on my phone, but I have not gotten to that particular one. He said, yes, that you've listened to it. I said, Holy Spirit, if I've listened to this thing, I will tell you now. You can't be telling me what I've not done. He said, you have, but you didn't know you have. That you were listening to some other messages that were before it in sequence with your earphone and you slept off. When you slept off, your spirit did not sleep off. Your spirit was still hearing it. And until recently, he told me something that says, See, even your soul doesn't sleep. Your brain is, they say your brain is even more active when you are asleep than when you are awake. Scientists say, I like, what? He said, Yes. So you lost consciousness, but your subconscious was still awake. So your subconscious listened to the message. So when you are preaching that message, he said when you are preaching that message, 
not knowing it was what you were preaching. That you are preaching from your subconscious. I'm like, what? He said, yes. He said, see, that's why the scripture advocates meditating on the word. He said, as you're walking, as you're sleeping, as you're discussing, he said, everything you're doing, be speaking the word, be discussing the word, be talking the word. And I got a serious revelation of that. I'm like, so if while I sleep, I am still listening to the message without my knowing it, I better use those hours of sleep very well. So that's what I did. I started playing messages before I sleep all night till I wake up. And they play in sequence. And I can tell you from experience, the benefits are enormous. Oh my God. I've been doing this now for, for close, if not more than 10 years now. I all of a sudden don't struggle with faith anymore. I all of a sudden notice that nothing comes my way that knocks me down. Nothing. Nothing the enemy throws at me now that can destabilize me. It's as if I've built a padding that can absorb shock. Anything the enemy throws at me, I just laugh at him. Oh, and guess what? He has thrown things at me. Oh my God. You don't want to know. He has attacked me on all sides. But I found that this habit of over 10 years, I've accumulated God's word of faith on my inside over 10 years, has an auto-repellent power. As he throws it, he bounces off. So that is where that shield of faith becomes a defensive weapon. That is also where the word of the Lord is also a defensive weapon. As he's throwing it at me, it is not penetrating. I know best and well to also attack by the spoken word. I've introduced this secret to a couple of people. I don't know how faithful they are, but the ones that have practiced it have come back to me to say, Pastor, Pastor, thank you. The key to this is not practicing it for a while and stopping. The key is constant practice. Staying on the word. Staying on the word. All The beautiful thing about it is that when it happens, when that transformation process uh, you know, goes full cycle, you wouldn't know. I'm telling you, all of a sudden, things that used to weigh you down, things that used to depress you, things that used to knock you down, you can get one crazy news today, you can get one attack. Usually before, you get depressed, you get cast down, you get knocked down. But if you do this consistently, you know that those things that used to knock you down in the past, all of a sudden, you will start laughing at them, as I do now. That is the power of storing God's word on your inside. That's the power of meditating on God's word. Wow, wow. I've really, really overshot my time. Now, I'm going to be very, very fast. And you permit me. Now, when you read, there are several scriptures where the Bible talked about the sword, this sword coming out from the mouth of the Lord, this double sword coming out from the mouth of the Lord. And I believe that the Bible gave us a lot of scriptures. You see a lot in Revelation. You see, when the world will gang up against Israel and we're going to descend from heaven with Jesus Christ, how those how those armies that will gather against Israel are also gather against Jesus Christ will be dispelled in a second. The Bible says that the power that will dispel them is that double-edged sword in the mouth of Christ. That when it is released, these armies that are still against God's people, that the power from Jesus' mouth will burn them. <laughs> And the only way I can describe that burning is what uh, a nuclear weapon does to human flesh. It will just melt and disintegrate. Zechariah explained it. I don't have time to read it up. I'll just show you the scriptures as I'm talking. Zechariah described it. The Bible says Zechariah chapter 14 verse 12. He said, And this shall be the plague with which the Lord shall strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. He said, Their flesh shall dissolve while they are standing on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. And their tongue shall dissolve in their mouth. They will melt away. 
from the force from the mouth of Jesus Christ. What is that thing that's coming out from the mouth of Jesus Christ? Did the Bible talk about it in Revelation chapter 1? Talk about it in Revelation chapter 2? Talk about it in Revelation chapter 19? I'll read the one in 19. Verse 15 says, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he shall strike down the nations. Which nations? Remember, that fought against Jerusalem. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Verse 21 says, And the rest we are killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the throne. And the beds we are filled with their flesh. What is that thing that will come out from the mouth of Jesus Christ? It will be words that the power that backs those words will even be more potent than the nuclear weapon, than the hydrogen bomb. That is how powerful the word of Jesus is. And Jesus is the word. It is that word that was made flesh. It is that same word that is contained in your 66 books that you never read. You you need to start reading the word for yourself. When you read the word, meditate on it, you catch the revelation of that word. When you declare the word, from the point of revelation over every circumstance or any circumstance that is before you, the power that is released is what that Bible described for us in, in Zechariah. You may not see with your physical eyes devils scampering away, running for their life, but you can see it with the eye of faith. Then stand your ground, refuse to bulge, and you see deliverance coming to you. When you speak the word back to him, angels are mobilized to work for you. When you sing God's word in praises and in worship, in prophetic worship, angels are mobilized and they go to bring the word of the Lord to pass in your life. All the ways to increase your sword-wielding skills. Number one, you need to understand how to pray prophetic prayers. No beggarly prayers. When you stand to declare God's word over any activity of the enemy, you don't beg. You command. Number two, you need to start studying. No reading. Studying to know the hidden mysteries of the kingdom in that word. Number three thing you need to start doing is start listening to messages. Fake messages. Don't listen to a lot of, there are a lot of trash out there. Focus on faith. Number four, meditate on the word. Number five, start teaching the word. Because when you teach the word, you increase in knowledge of the word. Because when you teach the word, you increase in knowledge of the word. When you teach the word, you increase in revelation of the word. Finally, take that sword. Wield it. I see you prospering. I see every messenger agent of darkness bowing before you. God bless you. See you at the next one. The helmet of salvation. It will be mind-blowing. Bye.